Hello, I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt for ACC.org. We're here covering the ESC in Amsterdam, and it's another day here, day four, with a bunch of terrific trials. And maybe, Gabriel, I'll start off with you with a trial that I think is super important. Honestly, I, I thought it might be the biggest practice-changing trial uh, from the ESC, and it's the IMI trial. You were involved with it, as a matter of fact. And I'm not just saying that because you were involved with it. I really think it's big, but can you tell the audience <laughs> what it is and what it showed? Yeah, I think it's a long-standing question that we've all had, that we suspect that influenza vaccination may be good for coronary artery disease patients. We've had some evidence from small studies, uh, randomized studies, and from larger observational databases with the caveats of observational databases. And everybody, including you, has been asking for a large, well-done randomized trial. And here it is. This is a large, well-done randomized trial. It was conducted by our colleague, Dr. Frobert from Sweden. And uh, uh, what uh, he did with his co-investigators is to randomize a large number of patients to influenza vaccination or no influenza vaccination during the influenza season and post-MI. Uh, 2,500 patients approximately. And the bottom line is that even though the trial was terminated uh, prematurely due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the treatment effect was so large that the trial is actually positive and shows almost a halving of uh, uh, cardiovascular outcomes of MACE in the influenza group, uh, vaccine, in the influenza vaccination group. Uh, it's a multinational trial. It was done in several countries, uh, almost exclusively post-MI patients. And I think it provides a very strong answer, a very strong piece of data uh, that complements what we have. And again, will, in my opinion, change practice, change the guidelines and be incorporated in practice. In fact, I think that after this trial, it becomes very difficult to ethically justify conducting another trial. So this is what we're going to have to base our clinical decisions on. Yeah, no, really terrific summary, really important trial. Congratulations. Uh, to everyone involved with it, you as well. I, I, I hope, uh, I shouldn't say I think, I hope this might also have an effect on COVID vaccine hesitancy, just having some positive data about a vaccine. It's safe. I know it's influenza. We're talking about COVID, but still, I, I, I'm hoping it helps there. Well, uh, as far as other data that could help an informed clinical practice, Karen, let me uh, ask you about the STEP study. I thought that was super interesting. Do you want to quickly just tell our audience what it was about and what it found? So this was a large trial, more than 8,500 patients from China, Chinese patients, 60 to 80 years old with hypertension, randomized to intensive control, aiming for a systolic blood pressure between 110 and 130 versus standard, um, uh, standard management with uh, systolic blood pressure between 130 to 150. And cut a long story short, the intensive arm uh, effectively reduced the primary endpoint, which was a composite of stroke, acute coronary syndrome, acute heart failure, coronary vascularization, atrial fibrillation, and cardiovascular death. And there was also positive trends of the components, especially with stroke, uh, acute coronary syndrome, and heart failure. So this really calls the question whether or not we should be aiming for similarly intensive control of blood pressure in elderly patients. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it really is extremely insightful and a very, very important study. Uh, Gabriel, let me turn back to you about Amulet IDE, another late breaker. It compared two different a left atrial appendage occlusion devices. In fact, you may not know this, but the amulet was just FDA approved in the US. So there's a lot of excitement about having a second device. The watchman had already been approved. And you know, when I was with uh, you or uh, your uh, colleagues as well at Opital Bishak, actually with Alec Vahanian some years ago, uh, we put in a bunch of that, that version of amulet. Uh, so it's nice to see some data coming out. What did the trial show? So the trial looked at a variety of outcomes. Uh, the first one was how effective was the device in occluding the left atrium and how much residual leak there was. And it compared the new device or so-called new device, which is the amulet to the uh, more uh, seasoned watchman uh, to device. And uh, the bottom line is there's slightly less fewer leaks with the amulet. But I think the, the bottom line is, does this translate into clinical outcomes? And uh, after a year, after 12 months of therapy, outcomes look actually quite similar between the two, two treatment arms, even though the antithrombotic intervention was slightly more intensive with Watchman, where the 
use of anticoagulant was more protracted than with the amulet in which most patients went to DAPT and antiplatelet therapy quite quickly after uh, the procedure. Uh, to be also completely fair, it looks like there's slightly more periprocedural complications early with the amulet device. The investigators pointed out to a trend related to operator experience as an explanation. Uh, but I think overall, the outcomes show that both devices are quite effective at occluding the left atrium, and their outcomes look absolutely similar, both in terms of efficacy and safety after a year. So it's a good news, I think, overall for patients. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I know in the U.S. we're excited about a second option. In, in Europe, you've, you've had it for a while. Well, one study just briefly mentioned, I was involved with it, Renato Lopez uh, presented it, the pronounced study. You know, it, it was a cardio-onc trial where we're looking at two different uh, drugs for prostate cancer, assessing cardiovascular safety you know, because of the pandemic and financial issues and that sort of thing. The, the trial ended up uh, ending really before it was powered to provide a definitive answer. But I thought it was a really neat idea having cardiologists and oncologists working closely together on the leadership of a trial at a site level. And, and hopefully will will serve as a precedent uh, for future trials in the cardio-onc space. And the final trial I'll just mention is the STOP DAP2 ACS trial, looking at a month of DAP followed by clopidogrel monotherapy in ACS patients. There are a bunch of trials that are showing that shorter DAP's probably okay. Most of the trials are relatively underpowered. Uh, but here it turns out there was a signal of harm in the ACS patients by stopping the DAP that early. You know, Gabriel, you've given a lot of thought to DAP through the years. What were your thoughts on this study? Yeah, it's not the first time. Uh, you'll remember the smart DAP and other studies also suggested that when you discontinue early uh, antiplatelet therapy in ACS patients or post MI patients, you, you can sometimes, if the study is large enough, and there's enough adherence to the prescribed regimen, you can see a bump in MI events or, uh, or MACE, and that's clear again here. Uh, and so I think it's, a, it's a, a statement of caution for all of us interventional cardiologists who seem to be rushing to shortening and ever shortening further the duration of DAPT post-PCI, that there are patients who remain at high thrombotic risk, particularly post-ACS, and that we should be more cautious in that population than we are in elective patients. Yeah, no, it's great advice. And Carolyn, you know, here we are at the end of what I think has been a terrific ESC. Uh, what is the biggest take home message from your perspective? Oh, it has to be the heart failure guidelines and the gains that we've, we've had in HEFPEF with the Ember Preserve trial. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably what most people would say, really a terrific time for heart failure. Uh, and Gabriel, anything that you would say differently there? Well, what impressed me was the breadth and diversity of the science we've seen here, ranging from influence of vaccination to mm -hmm. loop recorders for arrhythmias, the, the, the uh, multitude of heart failure trials, the COVID-19 trials, uh, I, I have to say it was an impressive uh, uh, series of studies. Yeah, I agree with you both. I think we deserve to pat cardiology on the back as a field. It's doing a pretty good job in all sorts of research, even expanding into COVID. I, I think that's really something that the cardiovascular community should be proud of. Well, I uh, thank you both for really terrific insights into the trials. Thank you to the audience for tuning into acc.org for further coverage. We've got journal scans, trial summaries, all sorts of stuff. So please take a look at what all is posted there. Thank you so much. Thank you.